I don't really consider myself an, an entrepreneur, but there's a lot of different advantages to being entrepreneurial, and we'll talk about some of those. I, I do, however, consider myself a leader who's helped a company be number one in its market for 25 years. What companies do you know of that have been number one year in, year out in any industry for 25 years? You know of any? Larry H. Miller has been the number one car dealer in Utah for about 12 years. Yeah. Now, of course, he's been around longer, but it was really about 12 years ago that they started to dominate. Before that, it was Rick Warner and all of their dealerships, which you know eventually got sold. And some of those now are Miller dealerships, but a tremendous company. And really, they are dominant. And I think they probably will be. So that's a great example. Can you think of any others? Any other businesses that have been number one in their industry for a quarter of a century? There's not a lot. And what that lets you know is that there is a lot of change that is constantly happening in every industry, in every business. And usually, companies don't adapt quick enough to change, or they don't have the leadership that adapts to change, and therefore someone else takes their spot. Hopefully today, when you get done, you'll understand why we've been able to do it. And uh, is that what we're talking about now, Darren? Can you read all these little charts? I just, it's interesting to sort of see. Um, here is, uh, this is, this isn't up to date, Darren. Okay, we ended up at like 540 permits, but for the last 24 years, we have been number one in our market, and we can prove it by building permits, both units and dollar revenue. And we could go back, and that's what, when you saw all those spreadsheets on the, on the screen, we could go in and show you the construction monitor's results and show you how we've accomplished that. Let's keep moving on. Um, Interesting, my dad started the business, and he was a developer. And when things were really tough in the early 80s, he decided the only way to use his lot inventory and still pay the banks back, work, their, work his way through a problem, was to become a builder. So we became a builder out of necessity. And, and yet then when I got involved in the business, he said, you know what, I think we've really become a home builder. We're not as much a developer, and we ought to be... Utah's number one home builder for 50 years. I thought that was a nice thing for him to say when he was like three years away from retirement. That just meant that I had to work until I was 73 to accomplish that goal. So it's interesting, but uh, will we be able to do that? I don't know, um, but we're going to try. So there's some lessons, though, that I think you can apply, all of you, to you know, whatever you're doing. And particularly, I give this message to you as college students right now. This is how I sort of approach things. Um, as I left college, it really should be the way you approach things in college. Unfortunately, when you're in college, you have to play a game. And the game is getting the best grades you can. When you really should be focusing on learning the most you can. But most of you, I think, care more about grades than learning. All of you who care more about grades than learning, raise your hand. Come on, be honest. OK. Most of you, that's the case. And yet, you know, wouldn't you be better off if you really didn't have to care primarily about grades, but the primary, the primary purpose was learning? I mean, of course. But going forward, the nice thing is you can learn and that's what everyone wants you to do, and they don't care so much about how you measure relative to someone. They want to know that you're constantly learning. Second, once you know your direction, once you figure that out, and, and most of you probably don't know it, but once you figure it out, you better go for it. You better be very aggressive. You better get after it. And that's true with whatever you do. Too many people are too analytical for too long and miss huge opportunities for growth and development. And what they really need to do is make a decision. You can always change your mind later, 
But be firm about your resolve on what it is you're going to do and then get after it because you will succeed so much better. And then if you dis decide you have to regroup, fine, but think about how much more you will accomplish if you have that kind of energy going into what you're doing. This is what I was just talking about. So things don't always happen, and then you rebound. The story I'm going to tell you today is about how we learn constantly, we charge ahead aggressively, but we rebound when things don't work out just the way we want them to, because never do things work out exactly the way you want them to. And over time, you're certainly going to get thumped. Okay? I'm going back to 1979, and I was 14 years old, and um, I lived in England. My dad was a mission president, and that was a, that was a weird time. <laughs> um, I go to England... And I have to wear this stupid green blazer. I go to the headmaster's office, and I'm like, how many times do we have gym a week? And, you know, what kind of... He's like, this is a serious academic institution. What are you asking me all these questions for? Well, that's what I like to do. You know, I like to play sports, and what am I going to do? And, you know, he, he was not impressed. He sent me down the, the hall to uh, my biology class. It was the first one. I walked in the door, and I sat down... And the biology professor looked at me and said, What's with you? I said, Excuse me? He said, Did you live in a barn? And I didn't know what he was talking about. I hadn't shut the door when I walked into the classroom, and it just sort of tipped back open. This is my first day at school, and I didn't know what to say. So, of course, I looked at him and said, Yes, I did, in fact, live in a barn. Is that a problem? And so you can imagine how it went from there. <laughs> and uh, as I battled through dealing with my headmaster on a variety of things, but I did, I did manage to have fun in a very constricted, very um, suppressed sort of environment because I learned to sort of develop my own formula for success. Okay, and I'm going to share that with you right now. When I was 14... Bored out of my mind doing these crazy lessons for preparing for my, you know, altering them grammar school discussions and whatever else. I started to think, what am I really going to do? I mean, it was a big enough of a change in my life. I started thinking, what am I going to be? What am I going to do? What am I going to accomplish? It was then that I had this idea I was going to go to Harvard Business School. At age 14, I wrote off and I got the application sent to me in the mail, and I started reading that thing, and it just sort of blew my mind. Wow, okay, this is a different world I'm not familiar with. What am I going to have to do if I want to do something like that? And I started to think about it, but I was also thinking about other things, because truthfully, I, I know this sounds, you know, almost ab you know, absurd, but how does a guy who's really not enjoying school that much think he's going to ultimately get into Harvard Business School? Um, but that was me. And I start thinking more about how am I going to make money, what am I going to do, how am I going to be a good businessman. I started setting goals for myself. I had a plan in place how I was going to do it. And then I knew I had to work my butt off in order to accomplish that. But, you know, what I spent all my time doing instead of being a student is I started my own business in England selling erasable pens because the year I went over there was the year that Papermate Gillette UK had come out with their first erasable pens, and I thought they were sort of a cool product. They weren't in England at the time. They were just going to be coming. So I went and I, I met with Gillette UK's, one of their reps, and I said, how about giving me an account? Because Papermate was owned by Gillette at that time, as it is now. And, and he said, well, tell me what you're going to do. And I explained, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take these things door to door, business to business. I'm going to get a couple of friends. We're just going to sell a lot of pens. And for whatever reason, this guy just said, all right, I'm going to give you an account. And so he gave me an account, and we started doing this. And it was a riot that drove my headmaster crazy because I would wear my blazer door to door after school, and he'd get calls, what's going on? And my best friend and I started doing things. He hauled us into the cops one, one time. He had us hauled in, and, and, the, and I, they couldn't really hold us for anything, so they let us go. And then the next week he met with me, and he said, you can't do this anymore. And I said, what, what do you mean? 
He says, I've spent the weekend at the University of Manchester Law Library looking up all the case law, and he basically started showing it to me. He said, in, and this was because child labor laws have become really restrictive after we'd gone through the Industrial Revolution. They didn't want people working, doing certain things, and so you could not take money in a direct point of sale if you were under 16 years old. So I said, okay, that's sort of a problem, and you're in my way, and I just listened to him. And the next week I went back to the University of Manchester Law Library myself. I found the same stuff he was looking at, and I sort of analyzed it, and I went back and I said, I understand the law now. I can't take it in a direct point of sale transaction, but I can sell, and then I can be a delivery boy, and I can take the money in directly from my customer. And so that's what we started to do. We would take orders, and then we would go back the next day, and we would sell, and we'd take the money, and we would just keep So we just went at it. He wrote a letter to my parents. I can no longer conduct my official duties because your son is driving me crazy, basically. And, uh, but we just kept doing stuff like that. And you know what? It was a learning experience, but I go back and I go through high school and I have some great experiences. I, I sell actually Nikes to all kinds of sports teams with their individual logos on the side back when that was first starting. I went to the University of Utah for my first year and then I go to Rome on my mission. And, uh, and then I come out and I'm saying, I want a real experience. And I did this all the way through college. My freshman year before I went on my mission, I worked for Triad, which was owned by Adnad Khashoggi, the arms dealer who was investing in downtown Salt Lake at the time and doing a major development. I come home, I go to work for the Division of Business and Economic Development at the state, and uh, I'm just figuring everything that I can do to just learn as much as I can about business. I started a couple other things. And then I start working for my dad um, when I'm in my senior year, and I go into it and I basically say, hey, you know, I'm going to become one amazing salesperson. Of course, I'd had a lot of sales experience just sort of on my own doing these crazy ventures. And I go through that. And then after I go that experience, I apply to Harvard Business School, and it was a shock. I mean, I got in. But, uh, and it was a great experience, but it was sort of an interesting time because the real estate markets in Utah were really tough. And my dad wasn't too happy that I was leaving his business and in fact, in my second year business school, we had made the decision we were going to let a key manager go, and he wanted me to take his place, but I still had a semester left. So I would just go, I'd get on a plane every week, and I commuted from Boston for my last semester. And uh, I'd go back and forth trying to figure out what needed to be done. Well, our business had gone through sort of a survival mode. It had, we, my dad had almost lost everything. He had his attorneys and his accountants saying, you have too much debt, you should file bankruptcy. We've got to turn things around. And, and I said, there's some real problems, but we're going to overcome them, the biggest problem being debt. You know, we had poor customer service at the time. We were, we'd been in survival mode, not that we didn't want to have better but there was just so many things that we had to do. So I start working on these solutions as I come back from business school, and uh, we just start nailing them down one item after another, and we start making all kinds of incremental improvements. We didn't grow our business a lot at this time. We just focused on improving everything that we did. So you can see that we drove very hard customer satisfaction up, and uh, you can see that I come back from business school in 92. We didn't just decide to grow this business. We actually just said, let's cap it so that we're selling 500 plus homes, but not a lot more, and really work on becoming a much better company in terms of customer satisfaction, quality, cool designs, everything else. We really started to improve. But the nice thing was our revenue started to grow because as we became a better company with higher customer service and we're you know, finding better, superior locations, we could sort of grow our business up. And we went, you know, to where we got up to about $100 million. And, and then the goal becomes, at the same time, what are we going to do with this debt? Let's get our debt to 
that would feel comfortable. We would never be as challenged as when we went through the downturn that we went through in the 80s. And we, once we got that achieved, then I say, okay, now we've got a platform for growth. Okay, we've paid down our debt, and we've made a lot of improvements. My dad, though, at the time, this was 1999, he says to me, let's wind it down. In two years, we can pay off all our debt. We'll have, you know, we can do whatever we want. He was playing a lot of golf. He was enjoying life, and he didn't want any more risk. And I understood where he was coming from, but I'd already started buying the company from him in 1992, the year I came out of business school at age 27. And I said, we got to ramp it up. And so we had this difference of opinion about the direction the business should go, and I felt it was time to charge forward. But I accelerated my buy-sell so that he was comfortable in knowing what he was going to get paid out. And it was a great time to do that. It had been a tough period, but a decent period. But, of course, you know, the next seven years for housing turned out to be unbelievable. So I was quite lucky that he wanted to be out. He had me accelerate the buy-sell because I, we made a ton of money in the next seven years and built these different offices that service our business around the state. We had always been a totally sales-driven company, but we started doing bigger projects than we'd ever done before, master plan communities with all kinds of amenities. This is something that I read, and that takes a lot more cash when you do that sort of thing. We start to improve sort of the, the stature and the quality of our homes even more. We go to the higher end. We start building a lot of move-up housing, and you can see when he wanted to wind down, I wanted to ramp up, and then he retired in 99, and then you can see what happens after that. It took me about two years to have bought all the stuff and to get it going, but then we ramped it up. Let's look at the next graph. Do you have the, not the cus customer satisfaction, though, pays a little bit of a price. You can see, because as we ramp up, you're hiring new people. Your new people are not as good as the people you've seasoned. And we have the revenue sheet side. This is sort of crazy. So in 99, he leaves. It's $117 million. Actually didn't do much in 2000 when I was first running the company, but I was buying lots of property and getting ready. And then the thing explodes. And in no time, you know, within five years, we did one company, one little home builder in Utah. We did $440 million in sales. And we made some good money. So you can imagine if you made even just a small percentage on that, it's a pretty good business. Um, I, I really threw, from 2000 forward, I really knew it was important to keep all my best salespeople. We'd always been sales driven. We took them on trips everywhere. We really celebrated our success with our sales team. Many people were offered jobs to be sales managers and area managers at other companies. They stayed with us because we treated them right. This, uh, you know, and then we know after 2006 what happened to the housing market. You saw the financial crisis come in, and again, remember up front I said you got to always be learning. You got to have that, this unquenchable appetite to learn. But then what do you do? You charge ahead. But when you charge ahead and something bad happens, you don't just keep charging ahead. You're you're a learner. You got to be open, you got to be listening, you got to be watching, and you got to rebound. So it was interesting. In 2005, I was always paranoid because I'd lived through some tough times with my dad. I worked for my dad for five years just making payroll and not having enough money to do anything else. I drove a Honda Civic. I was very modest in the way I spent my money. I saved about half of what I earned, and I just was frugal. I had not fortunately grown up in a hot market. And those of you who are feeling bad for yourselves coming out in a more challenging market, don't feel bad for yourselves. It's the best thing that could ever happen to you. You will be so much better off if you battle and get the opportunities that you get because of your hard work, your initiative, and your skill, not because it was an easy market. Because when the market cooled, I was confident. In fact, I was paranoid that it would cool. And there, that's what you call 
productive paranoia, which I think everyone should have. And in 2005, I was already, already anticipating the downturn of the market. This absolutely allowed us later to crush our competition. But I said at this point, anyone who buys an ivory home, because everyone was wanting to buy homes and flip them, I said, that's not happening here. So we came up with this joint value agreement, and we'd have our buyers sign it. We wouldn't allow that to happen. In 2006, I'm asked to be a director of the Federal Reserve. I go to San Francisco frequently, and they want me to report on housing in the western United States. I really focused on Arizona and Nevada. Those markets scared me to death. And then I started thinking, could what happened in Ariz or what's happening in Arizona and Nevada happen in Utah? I drove through an Arizona subdivision Lennar had built. There were about 50 homes all sold on four streets. I went into the salesperson. How come there's only two homes being lived into? She's lived in. She said, well, they're all just buying as investors. They're going to turn these houses. I said, that's a disaster waiting to happen. This is going to be a ghost town. In fact, I wrote the Ghost Town article, turned it into the Federal Reserve, and it was the only time my actual Federal Reserve report that went to San Francisco made it all the way to the FOMC, and they were talking about it. We've got this guy out in you know, the West who's saying housing's going to crush our economy, and it could be really bad. And you know, I go to the newspapers in Salt Lake and say, we've got to slow down the speculative purchasing. And the other builders and developers are saying, What's he doing? He's going to hurt our market. They would never say it to me, but they'd say it to like the head of development for me. And I'd say, I hope we do. I hope we slow down this market because the more we can slow it down, the healthier it'll be over the long term. And for us, the nice thing was we ended up selling a lot of homes during a period of time that no one else did because they were competing against their own resales that had been purchased by sellers that were investors. In 2006, I met with all my subcontractors, suppliers, and this is just a hypothetical graph. I said, I've got to have a graph to tell you the story. This is what's going to happen to the housing market. Demand isn't going to change. The red line, demand looks solid. Demographics in Utah look good. People are still moving to the state. People are still having babies. This is a great place to be a home builder. But the supply that's been lagging is now starting to get ahead of demand. And in fact, the green line will be an injection of investor sales that it's going to really hurt the overall supply imbalance and will cause prices to go down. So I'm sitting there trying to explain to subcontractors, suppliers, land sellers, everyone what the deal is. Only a handful of them really got it. But we stopped buying property. You can see in 2005, we bought a lot of stuff. And then after that, I stopped buying as many lots. And really, I didn't buy anything new, but I followed through on some of my own contracts. But that allowed me to pay off debt. And by 2009, June 11th, um, we had paid off all of our debt. So every lot, every home, everything we were building and constructing was on our own cash. And you feel a lot more confident when you move forward on a cash basis. And we had done that. Now, again, you get, the, you get sort of the lesson of the day. You learn like crazy. You charge ahead. But then when things go wrong, you, you step back and you take a look. What's going on? What's wrong with this picture? You adapt. You start to learn more again. The problem that typically happens with businesses, they get charging ahead. They think they're so successful that they cannot fail, and they have to instead have this paranoia that everyone can fail, and you better watch it, and that's what we did. So we changed a lot, too. Besides paying down our debt, we started to do more affordably priced stuff, including townhomes, and this is one where you all should live. This is up in North Utah County, gorgeous place, Swim and Tennis Club. Um, it's been extremely successful. Last year we sold 61 homes here. Let's keep going. Um, good looking stuff. We got into daybreak. We started to do sort of more affordably priced stuff where we had been doing a lot of four or 500,000. We started to do infill pieces that were cool, but in locations where there wasn't too much supply. This was in Murray. 
we just started to look at every possibility, sort of innovate. Not everything worked as perfect, but we did some cool stuff. This is up at Red Ledges where we're buying lots from Tony Burns and Nolan Archibald. We bought projects that the bank had started, and we took them over and we finished them right. And lots of University of Utah students made bank on us by buying these kind of units. They now live in them or rent them out. Those things are worth a lot more. We just are finishing selling out this building near the Audi dealership in downtown Salt Lake, just behind it. And we're looking for all kinds of little infill, unique opportunities. But innovation took a new level as we started to go through a tougher market. And we were ready, and we had cash, and we could do stuff. And while people were battling with the banks and trying to figure out how to stay afloat, we were flush, had cash, and could innovate. And we started focusing on things like sustainability. Ivory Financial Fitness was our answer to our sales people coming to us and saying we got too many people who can't get the credit scores they need to buy. So we started helping people improve their credit scores. We now graduate about 70 families a year where we do massive credit overhaul and help them buy ivory homes. Smart Move Advantage is a project or a product that we got a couple of really sharp guys running that ends up helping people sell their homes or helping them lease their home if they want to do that instead of selling at the time. It's been extremely successful. And ICO, one of my, um, we've really developed this business, but we're on the multifamily side and we do a lot of commercial stuff as well. And my um, buddy from business school, who was a partner at McKinsey in Dallas, uh, I talked him into coming to work for us and running the ICO side of things. And uh, we've done some very cool things. These are just some of the, and he's doing all these new cool apartment projects. We've got eight big projects underway right now where we're going to be bringing on some really good, affordable stuff that's, uh, some of it's as big as five-story. And then we've really worked on our designs, just crisp, new, fresh, fun designs, unlike, and you know, not everything has to be big. It can, it can be small and cool. And that's really been our biggest focus on the housing side of things. And we've been selling very well as a consequence through this market. Some of the new locations that we've added. We've got this, we just finished Rock Canyon on North Canyon over here on the other side of the Lavelle, Lavelle Edwards Stadium. And I'm, I'm working right now, I, I'm buying this foothill piece that's, that's... Seven feet up there to the right. So, so that's pretty close to where you guys are right now. And uh, keep flying. This is in Pleasant Grove. We've got some, some projects that we just picked up there. Sometimes distressed stuff from banks, other times from investors, other times we're buying notes. Um, and then this is where we continue to develop new phases at Ivory Ridge in North Utah County. Adobe's coming in right down, of course, at the point of the mountain. We're gonna, gonna get a lot of traction out of that. And of course, the NSA Center that's not too far from here, bodes well for that. Then we have infill projects all over the east side of Salt Lake County as well, but let's fly through this. Keep going. These, oh, Park City, that's one cool project. Only took us nine years to get that entitled. And uh, Park City, it's, it's right near the new hospital in the U.S. Ski, Center, US Ski Team uh, Center, National Ability Center. But the cool thing is, is too, even though while we were growing, we dropped down customer satisfaction, as soon as we figured out what was going on and things slowed down, we got focused again, not only on innovating, but getting back to the basics, customer satisfaction. And last year, we actually finished up over 97%. This hasn't been updated, but it's the highest it's ever been. And, uh, and our revenue is, is just starting to come back. We ended up with about 141 million in 11. This isn't up to date. Um, and that doesn't include our multifamily. So, and of course, we're bouncing back now, just starting to bounce back. We'll do 530 closings on the single family side. We'll do 404 completions on the multifamily side, and we're rolling forward. This sort of shows the combined. Oh, this is just, oh, this is what speaks really well for housing in Utah. Um, Basically, there's huge pent-up demand for household formations that should have been formed. How many people are staying in people's basements, doubled up in an apartment, you know, holding off on their purchase because they want to wait to know that their own situation is secure. 
And we, because of that, I've worked with the Office of Planning and Budget at the state to figure out these numbers, and they are going to really jump up dramatically in the next three years, which is going to bode extremely well for housing. Um, and this shows you sort of, sort of where Utah's permits have fallen to, and you can see they're almost back to the 1989 levels in terms of single family, but apartments are starting to pick up, and our forecast for a pickup coming here going forward. So let's just keep rolling. That's the presentation. And I know we've got about eight minutes. We're going to answer some questions upstairs. But uh, I think I'm just going to open it up here if anyone has something that they want to ask uh, about what we're doing at Ivory Homes, about our take on things. And then uh, I know they want us to go upstairs and answer any questions if you want to ask something more personal there. But feel free to ask it here, too. Any questions? If not, yeah. The, the question is, is multifamily is taking off and single family is not? The truth is multifamily is taking off, but it's already too late to get into multifamily. It's going to have the same issue that it always has. It'll get too hot and it'll cool down. And right when everyone's getting into multifamily, they shouldn't. And then single family is going to be taken off. So that's what we're planning on. But we've been in multifamily planning for this for the last few years. We're in good shape, but we know that it's going to sort of trend down in the next few years after this little building boom, and then we'll be on our way. But... Yes, Nate. Where do you see pricing going as permits start 90% of the economists across the country believe that, that pricing and the overall market has hit its bottom. And it's on its way back up. So, and it's, it's really location sensitive. Where there is incredible supply, there still will be some pricing hits. But in most areas where things have been sort of chewed through, it's going to be solid. So I'm going to wrap this up and just say this, and then we can talk more upstairs. But... Here's my challenge to you all, you know, absolutely, you know, do what you have to do to get good grades, but don't make that your focus right now. You know, get outside of that mentality that causes you to focus on this little tunnel that's going to get you to graduation with a certain GPA and, and throw yourself in to doing things that is going to broaden your experience base and give you additional perspective. Go take jobs that no one else is interested in. Try little entrepreneurial ventures that no one else is thinking of. Try lots of things that are absolutely going to give you tons of experience and, and give you lots of confidence. Then charge ahead as you figure out what it is you want to do post-graduation. Throw yourself into it. Don't be afraid to take that different trail and, and hit it hard and go at it 100%. And then if it doesn't work, don't worry. You can rebound. You'll get back on your feet. It's this cycle that will make you ultimately successful. And don't get caught in the traditional patterns of doing things the way everybody else does. Not only will you be more successful, but I think you'll have more fun, and you're certainly going to learn a lot more. So have a great day.